now on Sports Day. Full on footy analysis with Daniel Hoyne. Thanks to Champion Data, the story behind the game. Hoyne, welcome. Kane, pleasure to be here. Did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy round five and the different nature to it? No, I did. Uh, for myself, um, it was just another standard weekend, sitting on the couch watching all nine games. So I was probably one of the only ones that actually didn't go over. So it didn't actually feel too different to me. Um, but um, from what I've heard from everyone that's gone over there, everyone um, seemed to love it. Hoyne, you've never declared yourself. Uh, who do you barrack for? Who are you doctoring up the numbers for? Good question. I- no, that's a very good question. I barrack for the 19th team, which is called the Champion Data Team. Oh, Whoever, yeah. Whoever's best representing the numbers each year, and that that's changes right. uh, year on year. So we've got our Champion Data apparel um, in yeah, the yeah. office, if you like. Got the beanie and the scarf <laughs> yeah. and the jumper that we usually plug on at about round six. Who's the number one that. member? Uh, I would have thought myself would have been number Who'd one member. Who did you support as a kid then? Uh, Geelong as a kid. Nice. So, um, yeah. So there you go. How are they travelling Geelong? Uh, no, not going. Uh, Had a big win on the well. weekend, but the numbers. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a bit misleading in terms of what they're doing at the moment, and um, yeah, got a, got a lot of work to do. Okay, let's start as we always do with your overall observations. Where do you want to take us? Yeah, so I just wanted to um, just take this down a different path um, tonight, and sort of you know just watching watching these two players, um, you know, in the first five weeks of the year, it's just got me thinking whether or not we're going to look at these guys in eight to 10 years time and actually, you know, assess them and, and, and value them as some of the best players that we've actually ever seen okay. in their positions. Is this Sheezel um, Dacos? No, it's not. No, it's not. So we're taking this down a different path. So one's obvious and, and one's probably not so obvious. And the first one that's obvious is, is Bontem Pally. And I just, I, you know, just watching this guy on Saturday night again and watching what he's done this year and watching what he's done last year and watching what he's done since 2015, really, is actually quite extraordinary. So, Got so no our, love at all last year, did no, he? So no, so our, our, um, our rating system came, came into play in 2010. So now we've got basically 14 years' worth of data. Mm-hmm. And he, so far this year, he, he's on track to have the second best season we've ever seen by a midfielder. So the only season that we've seen better um, of him, if he keeps going down this path, was Gary Ablett in 2010. And just for context, Gazza in 2010 averaged 32 disposals and kicked 45 goals for the year. Yep. Bont is doing it in a different way this year, which is why I'm looking at him, what he's doing this year. Again, he is a a a once-in-a-generation type player. He has been mainly... You know, having significant impact in what he's done from a ball use perspective mm. for so long. This year, only Clayton Oliver is having more impact from a ball winning perspective. Mm. So he's changing his game this year to be a contest and clearance animal. And if it wasn't for if it wasn't for him in terms of what he did at the source in the first half last week, I don't think the Bulldogs would have been anywhere. I couldn't I believe it would have been anywhere I, this year. I, I did that game and ten clearances at half time and. Uh, he was the best player on the ground by a mile until about halfway through the last quarter. And Zach Butters just sort of took over and I ended up giving Zach Butters the votes. Bontempelli second, English and Waitman. And I know we do a segment, so I don't want to step on your toes about who they miss. <laughs> and I checked the coach's votes and I'm looking for Bontempelli's name. And he wasn't there. Like, do we need to... Do, do co- are coaches giving this enough thought, the coach's I, votes? Yeah, I... <laughs> to be honest, I fell off my chair today yeah. when I saw that he got zero votes from the coaches on the weekend. I thought clearly him and Butters were by far and away the two most influential players on the ground. And like, and, and I think, you know, and I keep on coming back to this conversation that we've had a lot throughout the year so far, is that, you know, do we do we just look at the stat sheet and see disposals and that's the first thing that Surely we're assessing a, a, a performance on? He's only averaging 24, 25 disposals this year, Bontempelli. But it's the impact that he's having on matches. And I'll get to another player later on in terms of how, how he's changed his game. Got a funny feeling on who that but, might be. But like, so, so what he's doing at the moment is, in my view, and I'm not sure what you think, Kane and, and Jared, but in my view, over the, over the last 20 years of footy that I've seen, there's clearly the, the best player I've seen is, is Gary Ablett. Mm-hmm. And the most, he, he's, he's replicating numbers and impact 
just like Gaza did. And it's it's the only it's it's the only player over the last fifteen years that is having the same impact on a consistent basis as what Gaza did. All right, send us a thought. Does Bontempelli get enough love for what he is doing? And will we regret not celebrating his career enough whilst he's playing, not in ten years' time um, when he has retired? Who's the other one? And the other one is um, is Sam Taylor down back, and I, and I, he's he's only twenty three years old. This guy and what he's doing so far throughout his you know his career, mainly his last three years, he only played eighty games of footy, and it got me thinking about you know you know we're having this conversation internally, and um and one of our guys Jacob Wilson referenced Alex Rance yep. and 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 how he reminds him of Alex Rance, and I thought it was actually a really good really good reference because I, I mean we've gone back over the last 10, 15 years and. Alex Rance is probably the most complete key defender we've seen in the game for 15 years. Right? In terms of, in terms of, he he would take the best the best key forward each week. So yep. he wasn't hidden. He would take the best key forward each week. Would constantly be the best interceptor in the game year on year, and his one on one record was you know pretty much unrivaled. You look at what Sam Taylor's doing this year over the last two years. He's the second best player in terms of winning a one on one contest in the competition. And he's the hardest player to beat in a one-on-one contest. Hasn't, did I, I heard on the commentary, I think Luke Darcy said it hasn't lost a one-on-one contest this year. Is that he lost correct? his first one. He lost his first one on the weekend. He, so he, he, he's been involved in eighteen one-on-ones for the year, and he's won twelve of them. No player has ever won twelve one-on-one contests at an eighteen. He's he, the first player ever to do that. He's also I've checked his ground ball get numbers last week. They were off the planet. Yeah, he's he's his ball use is fantastic. Mm. And the other thing that I that that I really rate about him, like Alex Rance, so this year he he doesn't get hidden. So he's played on Oscar Allen, he's played on Harry McKay, keeps yeah, you know, he's played on Darcy Fogarty, he's playing in a team which is getting bombarded with inside fifties yep. week on week. And that team over the last two years has conceded the fewest goals to, to key forwards in the competition, mainly because of the work that he's doing on the opposition's best key forwards. So, whilst he's twenty three, I just look at him and I, and I far, you know, and I, you know, I look down the line for ten years time. I think we'll be looking at him and celebrating it, as, as, you know, as him being one of the best key defenders the game seen for 20, 30, 40 years. All right, good stuff. All right, we move on to your uh, world famous seven main talking points. Yeah, so I just wanted to start with a big game on the weekend, Collingwood St Kilda, and just give a bit of love in terms of what Collingwood actually force you to do um, in terms of how they defend and, and, and they make you they make you play a style of footy that is not, that is not or common. St Kilda? No, what Collingwood yep. do to you. So we talked about this a couple of weeks ago that, that St Kilda um, have been using the boundary more than any other team that mm-hmm. we've seen before in the first four weeks yep. of the year. So they're using the boundary around about 65% of the time, which is you know off the charts sort of stuff. But against Collingwood, Collingwood forced force them to actually try and be more aggressive in terms of how they actually use the ball. They actually clogged up the boundary, which sounds ridiculous, to actually force St Kilda to actually come back through corridor, try and take more risks, and then Collingwood will pick you off. So think about that number. Collingwood, so St Kilda using the boundary 65% of the time. Against Collingwood, that was only 40% of the time. As a result, they're trying to ping off these kicks back in the midfield. They turn the ball over 57 times in through through that midfield zone, so between the arcs. That's the second most of any team this year. Low scoring game. Conley would score five of their 10 goals through that through that um, through that source through St Kilda turn the ball over through that midfield zone, if you like. We haven't seen St Kilda do that throughout the year. They weren't allowed to play the boundary game that has been so successful for them in the first four weeks of the year. So. Just hats off to what Conley would actually force you to do um, defensively. We've seen it. We've seen it throughout the year. Um, you know, albeit apart from that game against Brisbane, but this defensive system that they've got, which is so aggressive, um, is so impressive to watch. Joey Montagna uh, put up some great vision on 360 a couple of weeks ago, exposing the fly trap, which is around the contest. It sounds like he's got a couple of fly traps. <laughs> he has. Yeah, the fly trap. I haven't heard anyone mention the fly trap. That's actually quite good by Joey. So yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. Collingwood, we've had the uh, the, the fly trap. Now we've got Jay Gresham, who uh, has had a fair bit of publicity this week. Yeah, it's just interesting. You know, in your thoughts, um, in terms of you know watching that game on the weekend, I, I 
found it, um, I found him, you know, quite frustrating to actually watch on the weekend. You know, he's, he's want to sort of, you know, get out the back, um, you know, of, of the contest and try and be on the end of, um, of you know, of, of those real efficient chains. Just, mm. just didn't work for him on the weekend. And, you know, and as a result, he only has seven disposals. So that's, right. you know, that's the second fewest of his, um, of his career. And, you know, he, he's, he is that, he is that player at the moment where I think St Kilda are trying to set up um, you know the game for him, if you like, by being that centre bounce attendee who does go forward. So we've seen that through, you know, a lot of the greats in Dangerfield and Petrarca and um, Papley and on the weekend. Yeah, and Papley and these guys. So, so the game is getting set up for him. But you know, over the last three weeks, he's only kicked one goal over over the last three weeks. Over the year, he's only been involved in five scores per game, which is thirty sixth in the competition. For his position and for his position, for not his position, overall. no, yeah. So for his position, which okay. is which is quite low. So I just I just don't think St Kilda are getting bang for buck um, from from the role that that he's designed to um, to do in the team at mm. the moment. Which would be I, I don't I think it would be frustrating the coaches, mm. and I think it's definitely frustrating St Kilda supporters that I've actually spoken to. If you go in there, if you go in the centre bounce, which you know he, he's trying to do, you have to be able to win. The footy, like so, he's had. I just looked at his numbers then, just quickly. Four clearances for the year. Now he's a similar mm. size to Papley. Papley's had fifteen. He's yep. playing the same role. So if you put your hand up, I'm going to go in the centre bounce. You've got to go toe to toe with some of those big beasts that are in there, and we all know the names, and be able to win your own footy. To me, at the moment, he's either not willing or not capable of doing that. The rest is a bit of a bonus. Push forward, get a mismatch, lose your mismatch in traffic from centre bounce, and. and Bob up with the, with the smarts that he's got inside fifty and the skill, but the first port of call is, is sort of Damien Harbuck has said you've got to put your head over the footy and win it. Yeah, no, that's and that's just you know the frustration that I got just watching him um, on the weekend and yeah yeah as I said I've he- heard it from a lot of St Kilda supporters uh, post that game on the weekend. Okay, Doug, let's move on to the Bombers and uh, Alex from Hamlin Heights has asked uh, guys statistically according to Champion Data, is Essendon really in Premiership window or at least playing? a style of footy that stacks up in finals. Now, I know uh, you did this last night on uh, on, the, on couch, the couch with yeah. Gary. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the answer at the moment is yes. Yep. Um, and uh, I understand that, you know, we, you know, there was a lot of commentary around that last night. Oh, it's only five rounds in. I totally understand it's only five rounds in and things and things can change. What about historically, yep. though, Horny? Like you've said, it's a relief when you get to round four because you've actually yep. got a decent set of numbers. Does... Does it usually translate with some fluctuations, of course, from round five onwards? Uh, I think, when the, you know, that's why if you're an Essence supporter right now, you, you should be getting excited in terms of what they're doing because we can get, you know, and you know, we had reservations last year on Carlton who were in the same position at the same stage last year, four wins, one loss or, or thereabouts, whatever they were. But there were significant reservations in the way that they mm. were playing, and you know, we, you know, we always you know, no, go back no to that word turnover. Sus- yeah, we always go back to that word sustainable. Whether or not your game's in, in, um, in good shape down the track, and yeah, you know, they had a lot of issues. Yeah, you know, well, sorry, you know, not a lot of issues, but they did have some issues to work on. If you're Essendon right now, your game is in as good a shape or as close to a good a shape as you could possibly have hoped for after mm. round five. The thing that we're looking at at Essendon at the moment, and this is what we talked about on this show a couple of weeks ago, is purely what they're doing from a defensive um, you know, point of view. They've always been dangerous in terms of what they're doing offensively, but all I wanted to see is what they're doing defensively. And yes, they've been you know, quite easy to still move the ball against, so that's an area where they would like to still improve on. But once the opposition get the ball inside Essendon's defensive 50 or you know, inside their forward 50, they're the third hardest team at the moment to actually score against. We have not seen Essendon do that in 20 years. Wow. We're going back 20 years to 2003. It was the last time Essendon were ranked in the top three teams at defending their D50. That, that's just something that we, that we haven't seen from Essendon. So, so, so that aspect is a huge tick. And then we keep going back to the turnover game. And if you can't execute on the turnover game, the reason why we're so sort of, you know, always going back to it is that you've got 70 opportunities to score off turnover and 70 times you need to defend the turnover. Yep. Clearance says you've got 35 opportunities to score and, and to defend. So you've got the double the opportunities in the turnover game. If you can't execute that, 15 of the last 16 premiers have been top three in that game. You mm. can't do that. You're not going to sustain it. Essendon is absolutely right up there in terms of what they're doing in that aspect of the game. Ran into Adrian Dodoro a couple of days ago at Bay 101, best coffee in Port Melbourne. He didn't say anything. 
He just had a smile on his face. How many coffees do you get from Bay 101? I haven't had a coffee for two years. <laughs> <laughs> but gee, he was, uh, it is amazing how people's view on list management can swing and change just on the basis of a I, victory I think we were wait- Yeah, we, that's the point because we we're waiting to see the challenge and the challenge is still coming, but they've ticked the first box of it. They're, I mean, their draw in the next five still to come is extraordinary. Collingwood, Geelong, Port. Brisbane, Richmond at the MCG. So we're going to get... But their win against Melbourne oh, and the way, they, the way they we played to against see that. Melbourne. We needed to see that though, Jared, because it had been Hawthorne, Gold Coast, GWS. Yeah. Wins. Well, even GWS, I mean, they move the ball as well as anybody if you let them. They just absolutely suffocated the Giants at uh, Marvel. Yeah, and should have won by a lot more. If they, yeah. if they should the Crows be in the, the premiership window, Hoiny? Because they weren't, they were just outside. Yeah, so I think they're coming. So the reason why they're just outside is um, is you know what they gave up defensively in the first two weeks of the year, giving up a hundred points in um, mm. in both those in both those games. So clearly, offensively, what they're doing at the moment is um, is ridiculous. But what I wanted to talk about with Adelaide is is you know is just exactly that what they're doing defensively. So the first two weeks of the year, you know, they give up a hundred plus points, as I said before. But their last three weeks of the year, they'll be in the they'll be in that window in a heartbeat if it keeps going like this. So the last three weeks of the year, they've number four for points conceded, been the third hardest team to score against once the ball goes inside fifty. And this is the most impressive aspect: they're the hardest team to score against off, off turnover, and they're the second hardest team to move the ball against. So when that ball gets on the outside and gets out of contest and gets out of clearance, there is no better team in the competition mm. at the moment at playing that game. And we have, and as I said before, 15 of the last 16 premiers have been top three in the turnover game. Right now, Adelaide have got that absolutely down pat. There's something about Adelaide where I feel like regardless of who's there, and clearly there's a tipping point with your talent, like if they had a number of injuries, it would hurt. And I think particularly down back, but whoever comes into that system knows what to do and they don't lose by, you know, multiple changes to their line. Like Pedler comes in, plays his role. Hinge is playing a great role. Mick Henry comes in one week, then he's out the next. Stiff. It's, yeah, very stiff, as you said. So they they feel like the game plan and the structure doesn't revolve around the talent that's in the side like, like some other teams do. There's the first four observations from... The weekend, we'll take a number of your calls throughout this uh, little full-on footy situation we've got happening. Uh, Has Luke Jackson turned the corner? What is wrong with the Tigers and their ball movement? Harris Andrews as well. Who did the coaches miss? Hoiny's gem and Hoiny's horror. And your listener questions still to come. Hoiny, what's what's the tipping point with the amount of, I guess, key position players out of St Kilda's lineup, And how impressed have you been by what they've done with the personnel they've got? Oh, unbelievably impressed in terms of what they've done. Um, you know, offensively, I mean, everyone's lauded what they've done defensively so far this year. But in terms of what they've been able to do from a ball movement perspective, it's been unbelievable. And I think that's the main reason as to why they've more often than not been able to get a, a good score on the board. So, I mean, you know, they're going to lose Caminiti this week, but they'll probably get Tim Membry back in um, mm. this week. So I, I, do, I wouldn't be panicking if I'm, if I'm St Kilda. I'm sure Ross isn't panicking as well. I think it's more execution with ball in hand, which is going to allow them to score as opposed to the key forwards, you know, bombing it in there and just, what have you. Just before we get your thoughts on Luke Jackson, uh, Matthew Lloyd on, on Footy Classified said it's a great test for Michael Voss up against Ross Lyon on the weekend. And, you know, sort of the honeymoon period for, for Voss is over with the response he got initially in the first year, which we all love. But now tactically, can he go toe-to-toe with, with Ross Lyon? So the fallout from that game is going to be significant in particular for the Blues. Yeah, no, massive. Yeah, massive challenge for Carlton at the moment because, I mean, we, you know, where they are struggling um, you know, at the moment is clearance, obviously, but then they're obviously, yeah, you know, but then they're, they're struggling to be able to move the ball from one end of the ground to the other. And St Kilda are one of the hardest teams to do that against as well. So that's going to be an extra challenge. And then Carlton are actually struggling to actually stop the opposition moving mm. the ball from one end of the ground to the other. And there's no better team in the competition at the moment than St Kilda at doing that. Okay, Luke Jackson started the year with a lot of press uh, over in the West. But he seems to be uh, slowly getting better. Yeah, and I think he's um, I think he's another one that we're going to you know have to start judging a little bit differently um, in terms of in terms of what he actually does from an impact perspective. So, despite him only winning 12, 14, and thirteen disposals the last three weeks, he's been the fifth highest, eighth highest, and sixth highest rated player on the ground. Why so? so? Why so is he, what's he doing it? So it's the impact that he actually has when he actually does win the ball. So. 
So this is rating him against all, all ruckmen in the competition. So he has the second most impact of any ruckman in the competition when the ball leaves the stoppage yep. area. So his ability to be able to link up and actually get involved in ball movement is the second best of any, um, of any ruckman in the competition. He has the fourth most impact of any ruckman from a ball use perspective. So when he actually does win that ball, he's using it really effectively and, and, and being able to hurt the opposition. His ruck work, don't judge him off ruck work. He, he's he, he's rated as one of the as one of the poorer ruckmen in terms of impact from from his ruck work. So he gets the advantage. Yeah, he, that that's not him. That's not him. It's what he does. It's what he does from his follow up, his link up, and his ball use perspective that actually separates him apart. And he, and he has kicked five goals over the last three weeks um, for a ruckman as well. well so. Honey, this is and you, I, you can't be selective with with the ratings. The, the ratings are the ratings, right? But I always thought. Geez, Nat Nui rates highly. Like for for a player who doesn't touch the footy, footy doesn't mark the footy. I mean, you had him number one in the in the game. I reckon you know three or four years ago. Yep. Does some of the ratings favour players? Because I I look at Jackson and two marks a game and a goal a game, and you're telling me his ruck work is poor. I'm not seeing what the ratings are saying. Is yeah, that fair no, or not? No, absolutely, that's fair, and that's why I wanted to raise it tonight because. Sort of like I, I know, and to be honest, like I, I um, you know, I think I flicked you a message in the Adelaide Frio game as yep. well to say that he was going holy, and I was actually surprised about his ratings as well. So I went back to actually just do the exercise and 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 assess the twelve and thirteen and fourteen disposals that he actually had in that game, and then I actually understood what why he was actually rated so highly because he, he he's winning it in dangerous areas of the ground, and it's all going towards it's all going towards goal. So he, he's putting his teammate and his team in a better chance to be able to score next as a result of what he's actually doing ball in hand. So I, I keep coming back to these ratings, and, 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 and a lot of the time there are a lot of players in the competition both now and, and in previous years where I've sort of you know, deemed them as players that you need to watch on replay to mm. actually value what they're actually doing. And that's what I did with the Jackson example, as I said to you before, and then you know, be able to actually appreciate what he's done. Um, what he's doing. And just whilst you've, uh, you're running hot, just explain to Kane again why Nat Nui was such a, and is such a great player when he's playing. So it's, so, so we talk about the ratings in terms of, you know, assessing three parts of the game, how you win it, where you win it and what you do win it. Uh, so what you do with it, Nat Nui's ability to be able to win contest and how he wins contest is second to none in the competition. Mm. He always, you know, you're watching Nick Nat, it's always forward, 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 forward. There's no, there's no lateral, sideways, uncontested, irrelevant stuff in his game. And his ability to be able to impact the scoreboard through, through his ruck work is, is absolutely second to none as well. So it is, that, it is that high, high, high impact from not too much value. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting he's not a, a really effective player. I just never saw him as like the number one player in the game and, and I, just the question is do the ratings favour some players more than uh, Brody Grundy is another one who seems to rate relatively highly sometimes and um, yeah it's a, it's a question that I think is worth raising is it panic yep. stations at Richmond what have you seen with their ball movement it's an interesting one assessing Richmond I mean I said on this show a couple of weeks ago I've got a bit of faith in terms of what they're doing and what have you and I put my hand up now a fortnight later on that that faith is starting to waver a little bit in terms of what they're doing. And it, it's, they are so entertaining to watch their games because it is, it's, it's high risk, it's fast, it's quick, it's aggressive. But I think at the moment, it's actually too aggressive in terms of, in terms of what they're doing. So whether or not they actually need to pull it back a little bit and rein it in. So well, They've so, got much less experience behind the ball now, haven't they? Yeah, so... And in, you know, and in terms of what they're doing, so from a ball movement perspective, they're the fifth best team in the competition to moving the ball from one end of the ground to the other. So that's a tick. Almost a quarter of their score is coming from chains that are starting um, in their defensive 50, which mm. is clearly the highest percentage of any team in the competition. But it's coming at a significant cost because they're turning the ball over the second most in the competition right. in their back half of the ground. And if it wasn't for inaccuracy from their opposition, they would be getting punished even more than what they currently mm. are at the moment. So they want to play this aggressive game style, which I said at the start, is, it's, it's actually quite entertaining to watch. But only Liam Baker is, is, is exiting D50 um, you know, through, through his kicking ability better than the AFL average mm. for, for the defenders. So their other five or six defenders are all kicking below expectation when actually exiting from D50. So 
Oh, I just you know, looking at that and looking at that personnel that they've got behind the ball just suggests to me that they probably need to have a look at you know, do they actually want to be so aggressive? And then just on, or maybe just, just on, change the personnel. And I know they've got injuries, but they could change some personnel behind the ball. And then just the other aspect of this, uh, you know, such aggressiveness from from their back half is looking at looking at Dylan Grimes and looking at Noah Bolter. Yep. And when they're in one on one contest, right? So, so yeah. So this year, they're both sit in the top five players in the competition in terms of winning a one on one contest. Yep. So tick. But then they both sit in the bottom five players in terms of losing a one-on-one mm. contest. So to put that into context, they're either they're all they're all chips in. Yep. Either they're going to win it, or their opposition is going to win it. There's no in between. There's no you know neutralizing the contest. Just get the ball to ground, get the ball to a stoppage, reset, and yep. go again. We're going to win it, and if we don't win it, well, we're probably going to concede a possession to the opposition mm. as well. So. It is, um, it's just an interesting mentality that Richmond have got at the moment. Whilst you're running hot with defence, you've got Harris Andrews down as your last uh, Yeah, figure. Yeah, so a bit like, um, a bit like Essendon um, before that we are talking about. I mean, the only thing that sort of, you know, I was you know, really trying to assess this year with Brisbane to start the year is in terms of what they're doing defensively. Yep. They've been able to score for years. They've got, you know, some, some unbelievable talent through that midfield and in the forward half of the ground. But can they defend? And, and if they can't defend, well, you know, they're, going to, you know, they're probably going to get the top six alone just based off sheer talent. But they're mm. not going to be able to, you know, win a prelim and get to a grand final without um, the ability to defend. The role of Harris Andrews in, in this is significant. So, so Harris Andrews has been, has been, you know, their, their mainstay key defender, play on the opposition's best key forward each week for the last four, five, six years. He, and more often than not, he's done a good job. He's had, you know, he's had a couple of bad days, but more often than not, he's been, you know, you know, one of the best key defenders in the competition. His role over the last month since that Port Adelaide game in round one, that disaster in round one has changed. Mm-hmm. He's no longer now playing on the opposition's best key forward each week. Over the last four weeks, he's only played on Brody Majacek as the, as the opposition's best key forward. Didn't play on Norton, didn't play on Nick Larkey, and didn't play on Ben Brown. So Jackson he's, Payne has, has he? So, yeah, so Jackson Payne and Daria Joyce have now been handed the reins to look after the opposition's number one key forward um, you know, more often than not, yep. to allow Harris Andrews to be that quarterback behind the ball and to be able to set Brisbane up, peel off, be that interceptor, be that roadblock, if you like, which they haven't had for the last 18 months. As a result, over the last month, after that Port Adelaide game, their D50 is rated as one of the best in the competition mm. in terms of how hard they are to actually um, you know, score against once they go in. And they're now one of the hardest teams to move the ball against in the competition. So I think this slight tweak by the Brisbane coaches has been significant yep. and one I think that we just need to pay more attention to moving forward over the next couple of weeks. All right, we've got the coaches' votes right in our hot little hands and we do this each and every week. Who did the coaches give no love to? <laughs> Hoyne will start from a consistent performer at Sydney across halfback. Who was it? Yeah, so Jake Lloyd, um, you know, to start with zero votes from the coaches on the weekend, and he was our um, he was the fourth highest rated player on the ground against Richmond, twenty five disposals. But um, unlike unlike his profile throughout most of his career, he actually won eleven of them in a contested situation, which mm. was the second most of his career. So you know, he, his ability to be able to use the ball has always been good, but his ability to be able to win the ball in a contest was something that we haven't really seen too much from Jake Lloyd throughout his career. Papley, Nick Blakey, Isaac Heaney were the ones that got some uh, love there. Uh, what about Hugh McCluggage? Yeah, it was good to see Hugh McCluggage actually get back to some, um, you know, you know, to some you know, impact in the scoreboard sort of um, numbers on the weekend. You know, zero votes from the coaches, but we had him as the third highest rated player on the ground. Only 21 disposals, but the thing that McCluggage has been able to do for the last three or four years has been, you know, not necessarily a high disposal player, but a high impact, um, you know, player. So 12 score involvements on the weekend, one goal. To put that into context, he had kicked zero goals in his first four weeks yep. and in total had been involved in 12 scores in four weeks. So, yes, it was against North Melbourne, but it was good to see him actually get back to the, some sort of form. The biggest crime since Ned McHenry being dropped last week was Marcus Bontempelli getting zero from the coaches, correct? Uh, yeah, I, as I said at the start, I just fell off my chair when I actually saw that. So, to put it's to put amazing. his game into con- yeah, so to put his game into context, it, by the end of the season, it would be a top twenty to top twenty five rated game by any player this year. Mm. Um, he, his performance, so 
15 contested possessions, the most of any player for the Dogs. Only Butters had more. 12 clearances. You spoke about that before, Kane. But his ability to be able to do that and then still get involved in, in seven scores um, in a low-scoring game um, and then to be the Dogs' number one pressure player um, as well for the night is extraordinary. Early in the second quarter, Jared, I was looking up historical numbers because he had seven clearances about the start of the second quarter. Who's had the yep. most ever? The big fish, Paul Salmon, with 22. Because right. like, remember, you used to be able to take we used to be able yeah, to take the, the ball like the primer sort of style yeah. and kick it forward, and then they changed the rule on the on the back of that, and you couldn't you, you got pinged for holding the ball, and they don't seem to do it much anymore. But he he has had the most. But anyway, Willem Drew did a reasonable job. Kane, just on just on that, I just wanted to ask you: who, who who's the best clearance player that you've come up against in your uh, time? Would it, would it be Mitchell? Sam Mitchell. Simon Black. Simon Black. We're having this conversation in the office today. So I'll but ask you, probably you. not. The numbers probably wouldn't suggest that. But he was so clean. Like, it was just amazing. Um, but, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Who is the best clearance player you've ever seen? 04 double three nine eight eleven sixteen. 9 16 I mean, Lockie Newell's amazing. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. You know, you've done that game. But he got the 10 coaches' votes. I mean, he's, he's so clean and low nice. to the ground as well. Um, Connor Nash, nothing. Zero. Yeah, zero votes, but we had him as the third highest rated player um, on the ground on the weekend. So 31 disposals, which is the most of his career. 18 contested possessions, which is the most of his career. And then the other thing I just noticed with Connor Nash as well. So if there is one good aspect in Hawthorne's game at the moment, it's their ability to be able to win clearance. And, and yeah, they were really strong in that last half, weren't they? Yeah, and, and in particular centre bounce clearance as well. So... Yeah, when he's gone into a centre bounce this year and he's playing predominantly as, a, as that centre bounce player, Hawthorne are winning a um, Hawthorne are actually winning the centre clearance fifty one percent of the time. Mm. That's the third highest percentage of any player in the competition. So he, he's actually his role and and the role that Sam Mitchell's been able to to develop for him, you know, probably over the last eighteen months has been um, has been a real win. Okay, one final one. Uh, Tom Mitchell speaking of clearance players. Yeah, so... He's missed yeah, out again. Yeah, so I feel like there's a couple of Collingwood kind of players that are a bit of copy mm, and paste at the mm. moment. We've talked about Scott Pendlebury a bit this year, but Tom Mitchell, another one as well. So so zero votes, but we had him as a, well, yeah, we had him as a third highest rated player on the ground on the weekend. Just across, his, just across his year, I'm just really interested in this. So he's only averaging 25 disposals a game, which is the fewest um, of his career since 20, um, 2014 or 2015, thereabouts. But his impact from a ball use perspective has increased by 159 percent this year. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know what they do down at Collingwood, but he, he's been able to actually get involved in the way that Collingwood are actually able to move the ball. Which I I think everyone just assumed that he was going to be their stoppage. Really? He's actually been able to have a have an impact in um in in their ball movement game as well. While well, you're running hot, uh, I know we've got to get to a break, but uh, Nick Dacos. Uh, I ran a uh, small campaign for him uh, just rebutting some of the nonsense I've been uh, seeing on social media, or at least it's been reported to me, about his uh, inability to win a contested ball. His numbers surely, are, well, from my understanding, he's the highest ranked defender in the game for a contested ball. Yeah, no, he is. So, yeah, so there's no defender in the competition that's winning more ball in a contest mm -hmm. um, than what he is. And, and you know, there's no player in the game that's actually having greater impact in terms of what he's been able to do. Ball in hand as well. You know, you know so, you know, Jeremy Cameron, Jeremy Cameron and him at the moment are streets ahead in terms of the impact that they're having from a ball use perspective of any other player in the competition. So cop that, Daniel Horney in the studio, Horney's gem and Horney's horror, plus your questions after this. All right, we've covered a lot of ground, but still the important stuff to get to. Hoiny, what was your gem of the weekend? Yeah, just something just to keep an eye on is the intercept marking that we're seeing across the competition. So when so we haven't seen more intercept marks um, on average this year ever before. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing 16, 16 and a half intercept marks per game, uh, which is you know, which is the most that we've ever seen um, in a season. How much is it up? Uh, so last year, yeah. So last year we're looking at about fifteen. So you're looking at you know one and a half um, per game. On the weekend against St Kilda, uh, so in the Collingwood St Kilda game, fifty six intercept marks, wow. the most ever recorded mm. in a game. Jeez. So it is becoming more and more and more of a weapon to that have. Okay, the... moving on. What's your shocker? And then the shocker your on horror. the other hand is is the Tigers. So there's a lot of talk about the undisciplined Tigers. Um, yeah. So so far this year. They've given away nine 50 metre penalties, which is the most um, of any team in the competition. But since 2018, they have committed 55 more 50 metre penalties than any other team Gee. in the competition. 55. So, 
So they gave away the most inside 50s in 2018, 2020, 2022, and 2023. So it is, um, it's a theme that has been with Richmond now for the best part of six years. 55 times 50, horny, quickly. How many <laughs> metres going? I am giving that, I'm giving that over to you. I'm not, I'm not smart <laughs> I'll enough. save you, horny, because we've got a lot of text messages. We'll get to a couple before uh, we let you go. How do turnovers affect the player ratings? Yeah, so there's turnovers and then there's turnovers. So, yeah, you know, like as I said before, there's 70 turnovers a game, but sometimes a turnover can just be Bont and Pally kicking the ball 60 metres down the ground to a big pack and, and then Sam Taylor wins the ball back. Yep. That's not really Bont's fault. So that, But that still goes down as a turnover. But then, the, but then there can be a turnover where Bont's running through the middle of the ground and absolute hell of a kick that lands in Sam Taylor's lap yep. and that's and that's when he does get significantly penalised. How do you so, rate Darcy Parrish's season from Gaz on the Gold Coast? Yeah, so Darcy Parrish is a significant contributor in terms of what he's doing to the um, you know to Essendon's turnover game. So, so far this year, he's been able to um, generate 27 points from the turnovers that he's created mm -hmm. um, this year, which is the actual seventh most of any player in the competition. So doing a lot right, Darcy. So those who want to get him out of the club, please reconsider. Uh, who was a team that wasn't in the top three for turnovers that won the flag? Unfortunately, there's one team that's ruined all numbers forever, and that's the Dogs in 2016. <laughs> <laughs> they came from nowhere. They did so we just tried one well. that year. They, they now, Horny, I need you to come in with your armoury on next week because oh. I'm going to play you an editorial from Kane about kick ins. Oh, I've heard this before. I haven't mm. had this conversation. And whether or not you should rate them at it, Champion it Data. Just, <laughs> but we have run out of time. No, we have a separate stat for kick ins like there's a spoil. That's, okay. the, that's the solution to the Has been stat. discussed in depth. Okay, so we have that again tomorrow. Hoiny, and you can take that to the AFL for me.